great to be here. Oh, what an awesome privilege to be here. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for allowing me to do this as well. This Amen. is what I love to do. Amen. And to do it in the house of the Lord is always, always an awesome Amen. privilege. Amen. Amen. So if you if you haven't seen the Oprah of Africa, she's <laughs> right here, eh? She's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I scoured the internet looking for stories, for maybe funny stories, impactful stories about paychecks, paydays. And all I could find were memes on how it goes out as quickly as it comes in. Fa in, in fact, probably quicker than it comes in. And there were memes of debt and memes of anxiety and memes of worry and stress. Wow. And I thought to myself, how sad is this? Is this what a payday is to people? Yeah. Is this what a paycheck means to people? And so it got me thinking, do you remember your first payday? Do you remember your first paycheck? And what, did that con what feelings does that conjure up or evoke in you, in people? It got me thinking of mine, and it actually is quite powerful, and I never realized it. I was about nine or ten years old, and um, I would answer the phone in my dad's house for my dad's business like this. Traytech International, Stacy speaking, how may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> how amazing is this? I'm in my father's house, in my father's business, and how I was rewarded or paid for my services as his receptionist was whatever I wanted. It was toys I wanted, it was my heart's desire, it was clothing that wasn't normal or part of the allotted allowance. It was literally my heart's desire was given to me for serving in my dad's house with my gift of communication. And I just thought, how amazing is that? How much more powerful for serving your gift in the house of God? Wow. What's in store for you as a reward for your services? If that's what was in store for me at 9, 10 years old. And so your payday rewards for kingdom living, because essentially I was operating my purpose at that age. Sure. Your payday rewards for kingdom living is a guide for you on how to get back to that place if you can imagine that you were there before or how to get there if you've never been there before. It is the blueprint to help you get rewarded by operating in your purpose. And so with that, Dad, we're going to get into it. Many people don't know. It takes a lot of frustration, a lot of inspiration, and a lot of revelation. Share the journey before we even get into the book and what's inside this book. Share the journey so that people truly get a sense of what it took to pen this. So for many people, they know that my story and my testimony is that I just uh, refused to get born again because of the one thing is that God wants everybody broke. Um, it was the same reason why I left my mom and dad's home quite early, uh, got married. It's the same reason why I got involved in gambling. Because I just hate the stench of poverty. I hate it. Everything that it does, the way it makes you feel, I just simply hate it. And what, I, what, it, what it was when someone presented the Christ to me, um, my question was always asked, so how's God's view about us? I mean, is God really wanting us poor? And so we thank the Lord for teachers that have actually unpacked that and that it's not, it's not money. It's the love of money that God has got an issue with. And while that became a driver at the beginning because, you know, thinking that, well, God actually will reward you. I thought, well, that's not the bad deal, right? And in my mind, money was always the thing. And then the trip down to India last year is when we started, really. I did a presentation to the business people when I preached in India, and I was speaking about um, your payday. And I really never had the book in mind, but I did a presentation for them to understand their gifting and help people understand things. The saddest thing for me in India was to find out the number of people and what that in, the, the religious industry cost them, from, from buying um, garb to them paying for religious services that cost them so much. And I walked away really sad because, number one, 
of the ignorance mm. that they don't even understand. I mean, everybody's pushing for money. But surely, um, if, if God has got gold as paving bricks in heaven, we got the problem that if what we're pushing for <laughs> is working for paving bricks, yeah. it doesn't mean anything to God. We're discovering that the greatest challenge that people are having is ignorance. They don't know the value of the kingdom. They don't know the value of themselves. And this was where a nine-month process of writing this book and thinking about and recalling the last 20 years of how God's worked with us every single step of the way to bring us into, we haven't seen the fullness of it yet, but we've watched God honor every single step that we've taken to come into our payday. And, of course, you know, with God there's no end. So you can determine how fast and how high and how much you can receive from God being submitted to God and being obedient to Him. And so your payday has been birthed out of this, out of this frustration that I'm finding many people that are saved. And as a pastor, there is nothing worse than to find you know, God does for us, and so we travel across the globe. We've got relationships. We've been using our gift. Um, we've, you know, we're able to purchase a car. We're able to have, you know, a decent living in a way. But to find the congregation, having to still work for money is my biggest frustration. They don't know their value. Many people are saved, but they've never gone to the level of, uh, look, we live life on levels, and we arrive in stages. And the, for the majority of people in the house of God, not just here as a church, the frustration is that they have only gotten saved and never gotten into their purpose. And they've never come into even thought about that there is a payday and an, a reward attached for what you do for the kingdom of God. And so this is birth out of a place of, I suppose, frustration for me, but it's also God's way of putting a halt to my life and saying, stop until you write this down. It's 20 years and I want you to document this. And then looking around us and seeing the burden of the people, which will now be able to not just have a sermon on a Sunday anymore, but have a book that will help them unpack their lives, see where they're at, and the adjustments they can make to bring them also into their highest payday. That's awesome. And you touched... You touched on that religious mindset. We're going to go into that. We're also going to go into how the book is structured so you understand why it's something that is a working textbook, technically, for you to plot your, your path forward. So I want to just read something uh, in the book. You say, those with a poverty or religious mindset will always argue against God's idea of prosperity and rewards. And... The second part is that when we study the scriptures, we see a God that rewards right living and right doing. Is this not the reason why so many religions have people believing that if they do good for God, they will get good from God? This line of thinking is rooted in religion as it, and is intended to keep people bound and living under the law. This book is certainly not intended to bring anyone under the law, but to set everyone free from experiencing the unfailing love of God. What's so powerful about this, and again, you touched on this religious mindset, is that some people, and I say, in fact, anyone will look at this, your payday rewards for kingdom living, and there's this notion, this idea, the sentiment that's circulating in society nowadays with prosperity, kingdom living, and the idea of the church. What's your response to that? Just to put aside all that nonsense, technically, because God wants to reward us, and you go through that in the book. The beginning of this, when you, when you look at throughout the scriptures, you'll find that God deals with even Abraham before the law comes in. He says, I am your shield and I'm your exceedingly great reward. Abraham never obeyed God for anything. Ab Abraham never, never did anything to please God. Abraham was a moon worshiper. And he was so far from God. And yet God calls him and says, I'll be not only your shield, your protector, but I'll be your exceedingly great reward. What an introduction to a God. And here we're telling people, if you do right, you're going to get right with God. That's the law. And so we're not trying to put people back under the law. I mean, so, and if you do bad, you get beat. You know, that's what people are teaching. Is that before Moses came with the law, here comes this God who introduces himself as a rewarder. 
but not before you do anything. He, he offers himself as a rewarder. That was an encouragement for Abraham. And if you end up all the way through, through Revelation, you'll find that Jesus says, I'm coming back and my reward is with me. So every single step of the way. In fact, the Bible says the foundation in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 is that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And he who comes to God, first of all, must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, and I mean, that's not you even doing a thing. That's just you sitting in service this morning. And God will do things because he is, this is the God that we serve. And religion has put so many people in bondage. When you go to India and you find the people desperate in their hearts to serve God and to please God, they'll do anything. No wonder people would say, now sow 10 rand and then God will give you 100. And God is not pleased if you don't give. What kind of manipulation is this in the church? This thing is an irritation for me and it's part of my burden where um, we're laboring to see Africa and third world nations free. My desire is to see people walk free from the, the religious clutches because there was no religion at the beginning of time. And yet Adam received, he wakes up in a place of abundance because he, that's the heart of God. I don't know if I'm adding right yes. to, to no, your question. No, 100%. Just I think that makes so much sense. Let's quickly look at the way the book is structured yes. before we go deeper into everything. There's eight chapters. Yes. You've got God the Rewarder your payday and wisdom, the payday triangle, the man and his gift, the God factor, greatness in the kingdom, the 11th hour laborer, and new beginnings. But in each chapter, you've given keys, and you've got some depth charge questions for people to go through so that they can deal with themselves, put something that they can pray about, confess, um, ask God to change their mindsets about, why did you do it in this order? And why these type of chapter headings or themes as well? Because they're not your typical financial-related type themes. So, so first of all, for those that don't know, um, my background is when I spoke to the Lord, I said, this is my first book I'm writing. He said, it's not your first writing experiment, right? You've been writing coding for companies. Yep. You've been writing software. So my thinking always goes in a logic space. When I started writing a program, I would sit and say, well, where would I begin? The, I started with the fact that this is what the client wants. And then I go and unpack every single section in a way and say these key codings are, would be required to get this kind of outcome. So I've taken the 20 years and said if I had to speak to an individual that is in a rehab center or any single person, and they need to logically understand how do I build my, how can I build my life? Where do I start? What do I do? Um, the book has been written in such a way that it's, it's a piece of coding, building from one chapter to the next. So you can't hop in on chapter five only. I mean, it's, that's a standalone. But there's a starting point that will actually give you the benefit and the joy of finish reading a book because we don't like to read, number one, and we don't finish books. I mean, me, I go to a book and I look at the end and say, okay, what do you actually say at the end? But this book is not like that. It's to build you up because, remember, part of my grace, I have an apost the apostolic grace upon my life. Uh, the apostle helps people build foundations and then build their lives into the, the, their highest payday. So it's been written very specifically, but also the depth charge questions are needed after every chapter because after every single chapter, You've got to look at your life, reevaluate your life, and we're building something called your payday project. Your payday project is your life. You need to, need to let your neighbor know there are no reruns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're all under pressure because, you know, you make a poor decision, and it's not like you're going to go and erase it. You know what I mean? You can't go and delete and backspace. You can't do that because <laughs> you made a poor decision, and it's affecting your whole life. And so the book has been written in such a way that you've got to now think about where you're at as a born-again believer. And you've got to now ask yourself, am I really living in my highest for God? Because God is truly a rewarder. And so it's been designed specifically. And it's to really work on your project. No wonder this book, you can't say, well, you know, 
um, we're going to share this book in the family because it's not our payday. And you can't take my book because it's not, you know, it's your payday. You need your own copy because your life's project is what we're working on. You've got to work on you. Take responsibility for your day. Take responsibility for your life. Take responsibility for your gift. This is what this book is doing. And it's intended to bring you to your highest payday. If no one else wants to go, you're going to reach there because of Amen. your payday. Amen. Amen. So thinking again then of this, this story and this anecdote that I shared with everyone that at nine years old, I'm just, you know, using this gift of communication and I don't have to worry about rent. I don't have to worry about clothing. I don't have to worry about the basic needs. And you touched on this thing called the kingdom. You know, that's, the, that, that's what it takes me to is that when you serve in the kingdom, all these things, when you seek the kingdom, all these things are added to you. But in the book, you tell us how when you started seeking the kingdom, all hell broke loose. <laughs> now, that makes me think, well, do I really want to seek the kingdom if yeah. all hell could potentially break loose? And then, you know, in, 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 um, in the book, you go through a part where you say, I, I recall a defining moment for, for me when I sat in a meeting with Dr. Miles Monroe. He looked at me and said, son, a sure sign that the kingdom is working for you is when there's no anxiety. And you say, well, that statement just produced more anxiety in me than ever before because this kingdom, even though I was seeking it, was not working for me yet. And I just, I think I can identify with that. So many people can, yeah, can identify with that. I think I'm seeking the kingdom. I think I'm doing what's right. But all hell is breaking loose or it's not working for me yet. What then? <laughs> Without having to read the whole book. <laughs> so we, uh, we started the church and the church's name was called Living Life Ministries. And I just, I felt the call of God upon my life. I consulted with others. I had some counseling sessions, and uh, one, of the men, one of the men of God that I really respected, I knew he'd hear from God. I went in his presence and said, I believe I'm called to start a church. I fought God for many months around this church, and many of you know the story. About 18 months, I got sick, and God said, if you don't do this thing, you're not going to live. So I finally made up my mind and made a commitment to go after God, and because me and preaching, I didn't think. There was no way in my frame. I could ever be a preacher. And so when this opportunity, when I, when I finally said yes to God, I said, but then you have to speak to this man. I trust him. He's going to hear from you. And if he confirms that I need to do this, we, we're going to do it. So I walked into his office. I said, if this is not God, I want you to tell me right now I'm leaving. He says, this is God. You need to start the church. I'm like, oh, Lord, he has more anxiety. And I don't know anything about anything. I know how to hug a computer and write software. I know how to make money, and I, in fact, I tried to help God with, with money and say, keep the business, we'll make money. He's like, it doesn't work like this in the kingdom. You've got to let go of that and come after me. This is all my anxious thoughts. Now, remember the reason why I chose becoming a systems analyst is because I looked into the newspapers and found what pays the most. It wasn't because I, I said I'll study in that direction because I hate poverty. So here you come to God, and God says, now drop all your ideas of how you made money and come and follow me in the kingdom. This thing stressed me out. Now, I didn't know anything about the kingdom at the time. So we start the church, and we call the church Living Life because Jesus came, John 10, 10, to give us life, life in abundance, and that was what it was. And then God, as I begin to pray and say, give us the next steps for the church, the Lord starts, every time I fast and pray, He says, uh, to you has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom. And I don't know what this kingdom is all about. And I'm asking God, what are you saying? And of course, you know, me not wanting to read the Bible and, and try to find all of this, eventually I connected to, to, to two books. One was uh, Dr. Bill Winston about the mysteries of the kingdom. I bought all his series and everything that came with that. Then, of course, Dr. Miles Monroe and the kingdom of God. And this intrigued me because every time I prayed, that's what God was speaking to me about. So we ended up on the, I think it was our sixth year in 2011. I think it was. We hosted Dr. Miles Monroe. We brought him in. It cost us so much. Now, we were renting a place. And, of course, with the rental, you want to build a church. You want to do what you want to do. But you're stressed out. It's ministry stressing us out. The things we want to do. I have this thing working on the inside of me that I know it's beyond, 20, beyond a Sunday morning. There's going to be things that God wants done for us that's beyond us coming on a Sunday morning, worshiping Jesus and leaving people in the same state. 
for some reason inside of me it was. And then Dr. Miles was saying that, you know, most churches go and when they come in and they, they, they really worship the door. Because Jesus says, I am the door. And then they go back, they come as far as the door on a Sunday morning and they leave. But they never come through the door. And he said, the kingdom is when you accept Jesus Christ and you come through and experience the culture of his kingdom and enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. But can you believe, you know, we, you should understand this. That if they wanted to kill Jesus for an idea of who he was, the enemy, the reason why you and I don't like reading and why the enemy makes it like not a big deal in school, how can the meticulous come out of school not reading? What's he after? He doesn't want you to understand concepts. He doesn't want you to read. And so Jesus comes in as a thought from God. And they want to throw him down the cliff because he's introducing a new concept of living. So the attack you're speaking about is on the thought. That's when the Bible says when the kingdom is preached, immediately Satan comes to take that thought. He doesn't want you to read. He doesn't want you to understand. He doesn't want you to come into the kingdom of God because he wants you to come to church. Oh, he doesn't mind you coming to church and coming, clapping your hands and no understanding. But anytime you get into the kingdom of God, now you discover that 5% of the people that are called to full-time ministry is what's in the church. Myself, Pastor Brian, Pastor Z, that's what we're called to do. The 95% of the people that are called to function in the kingdom of God is outside of the church. Your business people, the media people, those in government, those in family, all of those are, are, are mountains that every single one of you have been called to occupy. And he doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want to know that you are also called to ministry. We are here. He wants to create the divide between the pew and the pulpit. He wants you to know, think that your life doesn't matter, that there's no payday for you. It's only those that are preaching on a Sunday morning. That is a lie from the enemy. That's the reason why we come under attack, because your life is connected to your payday. And God has saved you. It might not be full-time ministry, but sure, certainly you are called into ministry. In the marketplace and everywhere you go. The attack on every single person. You know, have your religious services. He doesn't mind. But anytime you introduce the kingdom, all hell breaks loose. So you actually then took us to our next question because, you know, Pastor Z and I, when we were working on the final proofing of the book, yeah. um, I said to her, how sad is it that this is the reason why we learn English in school. This is the reason why you learn grammar, you learn punctuation, you understand syntax, for example. But I don't remember a teacher ever explaining to me that Listen, the reason why I'm teaching you this is because one day you might be an author and then you don't have to pay someone else to do this. You'll be able to do it. Same thing with math and science. No one ever told us what the real life applications were yeah. of our education. Yeah. And, you know, I was angry at it because I went to a government school. I didn't go to a private school. And many of my private school friends, this stuff comes easy to them. Sure. You know, we had to get onto the internet and remind ourselves, you know, when do you use a semicolon? When do you use a colon? Stuff that I actually thought that I, I had known. But it comes back to the type of mindset that our people are oppressed with and the type of mindset that you're trying to get them to uh, aspire towards and inculcate in our people as well. So... Given your history, your education, your experience, not just, you know, in the ministry and in the kingdom, for life, what are the mindsets that you see that are holding not just our people back, but people in general? Because a payday is not about money, and in the book, Dr. Holland goes through that. A payday is beyond money. To say it is only about money is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. You'll see that come through in the book a lot. It's about prosperity. It's about a, an over, an holistic sense of wealth. So what are the mindsets that are preventing people from achieving their payday? And it's not just about money we're talking about. It's just also that sense of peace that you often refer to. So there is a tremendous peace in, in following the will of God. Breaking through that space, though, is your biggest challenge. Think about it. Let's say you've done five years of university. You've gone through all your schooling. You are now 22, 23, 24, whatever your age is. The whole system from the beginning, from your beginning and your upbringing, 
has been designed to keep you locked into a system and a way of thinking. That kind of bondage is the worst because it makes you dependent upon them. Everything about that. You cannot even think about your payday except thinking about what they're going to pay you on payday. But for you to create your own payday, to create your own ideas, to um, open up your life and your gift, many of, of people, the most of the people we speak to, the jobs they're involved in is not aligned even with their skills, with, with, their, with, their, with their purpose. A lot of it has got attached to the fact that I, I've done this thing because there is, like I did, who's paying the most? <laughs> you do? How much? So they called it programmer arrogance before I was saved. That's what they used to call us. Because the companies would call me up and say, are you willing to work for an extra 20, uh, you know, here's a job offer for you. I say, how much are you paying me? Uh, extra 10 rand an hour. I say, nah, not interested. Uh, 20. Uh, what are the other benefits? Nah, I'm okay here. Until you're okay with giving, upping my salary real, real seriously, I'll come and join you. So everything was driven based upon money because of my skill. And they needed me, and I made them pay. But when you come into the kingdom of God, it's never the chase for money. Money is, is not even in the equation. In fact, anytime Jesus had a need, he would let the world pay. A fish would spit out money. I mean, that's the kind of lifestyle I thought, but that's cool. Because here we are stressed out, not knowing how, where the next paycheck's going to come from. And don't let the company say, look, we're actually going through a tough season, and we can't pay you. Then everybody is miserable in that place. But in the kingdom of God, there was supposed to be no stress. It's supposed to be a place of where you enjoy what you do and the peace you speak about, that it's supposed to be fun. You're supposed to walk into the company and, you know, the truth is that we worked so hard this week around this book to finish the product. Pastor Z got home, can you believe, eh? She was partying the whole night. She got home 5 o'clock one morning. The other morning, she got home 2 o'clock. Everybody working on the project that God had given us, tired this week, but so satisfied with the peace, with the joy, with the strength, because of what God has called us to do. How many people in the world can tell you that? How many people in the world can say that I thoroughly enjoy my job, I enjoy even if the, all the money is not there yet, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, and I, my gift is developing, not my skill. Because your job is what they pay you to do. But your work is what you were born to do. They can fire you from your job, but they can't fire you from your work. Your work comes from God. It's eternal. Your pay is attached to your work, not your job. That means the company can go down. I can move to the United States. I can go anywhere in the world. Why? Because my gift will make room for me. In fact, I think I've touched on another chapter there. Eh? Yeah. yeah. So I have to then ask the question, since we're still talking about the concept of money and that it's not about money, you have not mentioned tithing in this book. There's no chapter dedicated to the offering basket. Why <laughs> is that? <laughs> because that's what people will think, right? Is wow. I'm doing this, therefore God's going to give to me. It's, it's hard between, because you, in fact, another part of the book, you say, this is what we do. This is a mindset that we have. You don't do these things in order to get something. It's just who we are as a people. This is what we how we operate in the kingdom. Yes. And I think it would be, uh, people would be hard-pressed to say, I don't even have to talk about tithing. It's about my gift. It's about changing my mindset. You know, there's a disconnect here. Why is that? Yeah, we've, how sad it is that the church has relegated God to a uh, slot machine. How sad that there's no relationship, that you've come to church because you want something from God only. And that you don't have a relationship with the king. And that you just want a job or you just want to get married or you just want a house and then you're gone. What a sad existence that we've relegated God down to just material things. In fact, there's in scripture, it speaks about a rich young ruler that came to follow after Jesus. And he says, I want the, this life that your disciples are living in. And Jesus looks at him and says, well... You've got all that you have. He says, you know the law. Honor your mother, your father, and the like, and then take up your cross and follow me. He says, 
and take what you have and give it to the poor. That means give into my vision because I've come for the poor. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me for the poor. And the Bible says he was sad at that saying. He couldn't part with what he had for the greater riches. So the disciples, and of course, you know, we all know Peter, Peter the big mouth. He's like, but hold on. We left our fishing business. We left all that we had to follow you. He says, no one having left house, lands, parents, mother, whatever for the kingdom of God will not only get eternal life, but receive a hundredfold in this lifetime. There's a payday for anybody that follows after God. Come on, somebody. You need to clap your hands this morning. Because it's, 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 it's so sad that you, that you treat God and say, well, I put in a hundred, I need to get a hundred back. Now, listen, we all were there. We would bargain with God. I mean, to part like with a, with a tithe. Your tithe is 500 rand, but you can't let it go. How sad. I remember having a hundred rand in my bank, and I'm sitting at a Creflo Dollar meeting, and the Lord says to me, take the hundred rand and sow it into, into his meeting. And I couldn't part with a hundred rand. I'm, my mind goes petrol, my mind goes food, my mind goes, because poverty does that to you. That's why Jesus, when he comes, he gives you himself. Poverty is a result of broken relationships. It's got nothing to do with money. Because when you heal your relationship with Christ and you connect with the right relationships that he has for you, no one abuses you. You don't think of running out because he's the God of abundance and, and no lack. So I'll tell you why you'll also enjoy this book is often you see Dr. Holland, Apostle Holland, Pastor Holland, wherever you've been in this journey with Kingdom Life Embassy or even Living Life Ministries, and you hear him preaching the word and you think, yeah, okay, that's cool. You know, I want to apply that stuff. But people always want to zero into what decision did you really make? Like the hundred rand that you couldn't part with. You, we want to know, um, apart from the highlights, give us the day-to-day -day steps that you made. And in the book, my dad shares his testimony with you from how he perceives what a payday is, what he did, and also the lessons that he had to learn. One of those lessons that he did learn was in my own life, this is what he mentions in the book, in my own life, I realized there are rewards that I am reaping today because of the seeds that my parents sowed and sacrifices made in their lifetime. Though they may have never seen the harvest thereof, today I'm reaping the rewards of generational blessings. They made sacrifices so that I could be where I am today. One way I can honor them is by wearing my blessings well, documenting his faithfulness and passing down what has been handed down to me to empower the next generation. And then you go into, I recall a few months after the passing of my father-in-law. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to let you share the testimony of it and what you learned from that experience as well of how you are training a new generation because of what was sown before you were even born. So, so that's the God that we serve. Remember that God's a generational God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. He's going to start something in one generation and pass it on. Uh, from my dad, who even when he was on his dying bed and, you know, pastors, he went there and said, Dad, you can't die now because you, you know the, the vision God put in your heart. Um, for many of that, that know that my dad had, a, had an encounter with God and an angel. And my name came from, uh, he wasn't, when my mom gave birth to me, she wasn't allowed to give me a name. So uh, when my dad had an encounter with the angel, he said his name would be called Maxwell Benjamin. And that's after many months. So he wrote that down, and that is how come my name is. Um, and you find that God worked something in my dad's heart and in his mind uh, that on his dying bed, when, when, when pastors, he said, no, you need to see the things that God's still going to do through, do through him. He says, then he said to pastors, he said, I've seen it. You need to let me go. I've seen what God's going to do. Because my dad was faithful in the call of God and doing what God had called him to do. But the one thing that stood out for us is that when I discovered my father-in-law, um, when he was uh, alive, he would fund people at their education and, um, and the like. And so he, he would quietly just sow seed. And this is not even a born-again believer, but he would do that. And what it meant for, for, for us, even as a, as a, as a as for change and an education center is that um, after his passing, here comes this young guy 
And he says, I've come to just, I want to see Mr. Benefeld. And so they said, oh, sorry, man, he's passed on and the like. He says, I need to come back and honor him. He says, this man, here's my degree. I've come through university, and this man has funded my whole studies, and no one knew about it. And what that meant was there's this part of a generational blessing that what he sowed in his generation, we are running our own education centers here. We're running our own schools over here because of the benefit of what the previous generation has done. So, so Psalm 112 is very clear. It says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. His seed will be mighty upon the earth. That means so often it's not even about you. It's about the next generation and those to come. We know that the center that we're building is not even going to be. We won't see the fullness of what the seed we're planting. Because sometimes you, you, you're planting seed uh, of, of, of trees that you would not, you're planting trees of the shade you're never going to experience, you know, for your future. But our children's children will come back one day and pick up your payday and say, me too, because of what we're doing in one generation. Amen. Amen. So we live in a world where you have retirement annuities. You have insurances, you have life covers. You know, I remember when I started working in, in corporate, they hound you about disability cover. And I thought as a, this young person in corporate, why are you reminding me about things like this now? Or why are you putting it in my face? There's so much information. I need to make these decisions with how I split this paycheck. <coughs> my apologies. How I split this paycheck of mine. And you're bombarded with information. There's cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and people are thinking, okay, well, if I want to jump in those levels from a financial perspective, from a prosperity perspective, making sure my family is okay, you get a sense that you need better quality information. Yeah. And you speak about this in the book. You speak about wisdom and requiring wisdom. But you zero in on the fact that there are two types of wisdom. What are those? Share with us why it's so important to know the difference between the two. So there's wisdom that comes from above and there's earthly and sensual wisdom. So think about that, that God is sovereign. He doesn't need anybody's input. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need you to counsel him. God has got, he is supreme and he is sovereign. Everyone else needs an overlord. That means you need somebody. There, there is no original thinking. There's no original thought. You are, every day we're being shaped by someone else's thinking. So, there are people, because of our makeup and the way God has designed us, you're either getting your wisdom from the world or you're getting it from God. The wisdom is telling you, I mean, the wisdom of the world is failing so bad that if you're having the problems that we're having in government, even just our education system, that you've gone through matric, and even if you go through university, you can't come out there with a the certainty that you can actually be functional or become a contributing member of society. How crazy is that? And so that tells us that we are not getting the wisdom that comes from God. We are using man's wisdom and we're enforcing that upon the children. And the, no one's gift is attached to their lives. The wisdom that comes from above is not there. And every single one of us, you have to think about the statement. It's in the book. Your world is a reflection of your wisdom. So tell me what your world looks like. And I'll tell you the wisdom you're operating with. Because there's wisdom that comes from man, and then there's wisdom that comes from God. And we must now begin to understand that God's wisdom is always available. And I love the idea that, you know, when I spend time in the presence of God, and God would give us a name like your payday, never been seen before. The creativity of what to do. That never came from a man. That came from the wisdom that comes from above. And there is a way that you can tap into that. And it's, the, the truth is that it's my little mind gets to rub off from God's great mind when you are in the presence of God because of His wisdom. You're spending time in His Word. You're spending time in his, in, with others that are wise. The Bible says that others that are wise. And you, you become wiser when you do that. And so um, there is a place of us going to go and fetch wisdom that comes from above and not running to education systems only. Now, those things are good but they can't be my driver because the things that God would work through certain people and they've got the thoughts, they thought up some stuff and they've passed down certain things. There's nothing new under the sun. But when it comes to God and His wisdom, He will give you things that are unique, that comes from His word, that will help you understand life. And in fact, think about this. 
wisdom. Imagine somebody being right at the beginning of God's creation. The Bible says, wisdom says, I was there when he started. When he made his will, I, wisdom, was hanging with him. That tells you wisdom knows where the gold is. Come on, God made, God, if God made the earth, then surely wisdom can tell you where's gold, where's diamonds, where's the oil, whether Bitcoin is right, whether this is the right move to go, where to stay. Wisdom will take you there. Not man will sell you fear. You must have this insurance and that, that. They're selling you fear. They're not selling you cover. If there's no fear, you won't take it. They're not, and, and it's, this chapter excites me so much because I find out that you can change your whole life by just connecting to the wisdom of God. I find people's lives are changed forever because they're connected to the wisdom of God. The stress goes. I mean, man's wisdom says clap 12 times. That's your salary every single month. But wisdom is there every single day. To bring you into your destiny, to help you build a life of success in God. Wisdom. Wisdom. So here's the deal. Whenever somebody speaks to me, I'm asking, is this the wisdom of God? Or is this your own made up thing? It becomes really easy. So we've been given a five minute mark. I see a five so minute. I see. I still want to ask. I thought there's just only five more questions to go. Okay, fine. It's only <laughs> five minutes. Are. Praise the Lord. So, I mean, you, you included in the book one of our favorite quotes is that um, knowledge is knowing that um, a tomato is actually a fruit, but wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Yeah. And that's when, when you start to see yeah, the difference in what God will download on yeah. the inside of you. Because we have, we faced with all these questions all the time, with all these decisions all the time. One of the biggest challenges facing our society nowadays, and if you want to buy a test of a, a show of hands, how many of you look at social media and go online, and there's a part where things inspire you, and then it shifts into a place of, what am I doing wrong? How come they get to have this and I don't get to have it? Huh? Show of hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be honest. I do it on a daily basis. Yeah. And in the book you say, so don't look at what others are doing, saying, or sowing. And you share a story, I won't share it now for the sake of time, as to how God reminded you to just keep focused on what He's given you to do. Help people with some form of wisdom and insight now as to you can get inspired from other people, but there's a part where you just have to lock in on what God has given you to do. That becomes critical if you're going to fulfill your payday and come into your highest payday for God. Is that um, I, I remember driving down a friend that used to come visit every end of the month. Have you, don't you have friends like that? They don't see you when they, you know, no, 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 it's, it's, you know, if they have money, you don't see them. But, you know, if, if they need anything, they come and they, they, hi, how are you doing? So when I know that Sunday call is like, hey, I'm on my way to your house. And you know, you're a young, born-again believer, and I don't want to offend people, and I just love people, and I want to do what's right. And this guy says, I'm on my way with my family. And by the way, I like chicken, and I like Fanta Orange. We don't have money. And in my anger, this is now me trying to just, you know, you know when you, you know you're angry and you're thinking like, God, I don't want you to know that I'm angry, but I really am, but I want to be a nice Christian. And so I just want to do what's right. So I'm driving down to, to once again to Spa to get chicken, but I know I'm going to bribe this thing and I'm going to... And as I'm driving, I said, God, I need to deal with this man or you need to deal with him, but something's got to change. And as I'm driving, the Holy Spirit says to me, if you're sowing what he's sowing, you're going where he's going. Straight away, God was speaking to my payday. He says, doesn't matter who's trying to manipulate you. Doesn't matter who is trying to abuse you, even as a baby Christian. If you do what is right, your payday is going to be different to everybody else's. I chose to serve, I chose to sow, and do things differently than anybody else. And people would come to me and say, but I see God has done this next thing for you. It's, it's like God got favorites. He hasn't. He hasn't. It's just I'm deliberate in my sowing and my serving. Wherever I go, if my heart's not in a thing, I either, either ask God to remove me from the place or change my heart so I can serve properly. Why? Because it's my destiny. It's my family. It's this church. This church is sown into many churches. 
The same principles that is applied to my life. You'll hear the testimonies of sons and daughters of how all their lives are changing, built upon the same principle about whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. That is for every single one of us. And, and we're watching now, even in this season where I'm serving on the board of Dr. Bill Winston, and how God's been training us. And I just didn't know why. Why would He call me in to serve in this place? And it's, 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 we never had a conference as Kingdom Life Embassy this year. But we were in Zambia with Dr. Bill Winston. We've been hosting him. We've been doing that. That's not even for us. That's for him. And his ministry looks really, really good. And we are this few people that are serving him in Johannesburg. But it's got nothing to do with another church. It's got to do what's coming out of Kingdom Life Embassy and all the sons and daughters in this place. Because whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. We've taken it personally. You see it happening in the sons and daughters. Now it's for everyone in Kingdom Life Embassy. If you've not realized it yet, Kingdom Life Embassy sows the seed. We went last year to, this, to, to, to Chicago. We go now again in September. And we took this time a, a seed in dollars from Kingdom Life Embassy. We took the tithe of the tithe. And we went to go and lay on the altar for, for, for Kingdom Life Embassy for everyone in this house. Why? It's the same principle for me as it is for the sons and daughters as it is for Kingdom Life Embassy. We're living out and in, in coming into our highest payday for God. Amen. That's exciting stuff right there. So I'm going to combine my last two questions into one. Um, in page 108, I think it is, of the book, you say, if you feel frustrated that you are locked in time, find a place or person to serve. Yes. Now, many of you would have heard Dr. Holland ministering and teaching about the God triangle, and in, in the book you refer to it as the payday triangle. It's the concept of purpose, time, and seasons. Yes. And so you speak about people feeling locked yeah. in time, yeah. but you say, go and find a place or a person to serve. And you go into relationships afterwards. You speak about the relationship that Adam had with God where everything was provided, but once he lost that relationship, toil entered in, yep. work entered in. We speak, you speak about Adam, uh, I mean Abram and Lot and the power of a relationship and how it brought prosperity, but when that relationship was, was severed, something happened in Lot's life. That's so, good. so just as a final word to everyone, share with us your thoughts and your insights on time and relationships and why they're so pivotal to your payday. Time is powerful because you, a, a beggar can become a billionaire because of time. Time, 24 hours, God has given to every single one of us. In time, when God, when you're dealing with the, with the payday triangle, God still gives you 24 hours. But it's like nothing supernatural happens in your life. When, when if, you, if nothing's happening in your life right now, if you're single, if you um, don't have a job, if you don't know what to do, uh, the deal is to sow and serve somewhere. Sometimes you don't have money. But you do have your hands to sow, to serve. You can go and sweep the floors. You can get involved in carrying speakers, help different ministries. Because it's your season, it's your time to sow and to serve. When you're in time, you know it because nothing supernatural is happening in time. It's when you come into your season. So the Bible says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So seasons, to everything there's a season. Things are for seasons. And time is for purpose. So if you're in school... You don't need a car, you don't need a wife, you don't need a husband, you're in time. What do we want? We only want a good report. Because you're in time, nothing supernatural is happening. You get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, or get to school at 8 o'clock, you go for and it's homework, da, 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 and it's repeat every single day. Go to bed early, get up. What's God doing? He's got you in time. Because time is for discovering your purpose. This is why I feel the, ch the schools have lost it. Because if the child doesn't know his purpose, once he comes out of time, then our, there's a problem with our system. That's for another day. But in seasons, when God supernaturally begins to unlock what belongs to you, then books manifest. Then the baby comes. Then the, all your business things come together. But if you've done right what is in time, it's really important to understand that. So one of the things around relationships, remember that relationships are kingdom assets. They're kingdom assets. Anytime you break off relationship, who will, who will promote you? It was David's serving his father's house that ended up killing Goliath and taking Goliath's head off. He was just serving his father. It was his relationship with his father. One of the daughters I spoke to yesterday, um, she put in a frame, uh, I need to, uh, she's trusting God for her husband and the like. We're having this conversation yesterday. And one of the things is that she's like, every year I'm going to travel overseas. And she's almost complaining last Sunday. 
She says to the Lord, I haven't, it's already July, and we haven't even got a plan to travel. So she puts in, goes home after service on Sunday, writes on her frame, I need to travel this year. So God, you need to make a way. She gets to work yesterday morning, uh, Monday morning, and the first email she gets is from the head of the company that she needs to, she, she does announcements in the church. She's going to be doing basically the announcements for 3,000 of the people in the Netherlands. I'm saying this because when you're functioning out of your payday, a simple thing as coming to church on a Sunday morning and doing the announcements and getting involved here is connected to the harvest of where you're going to. And if you can do it right here, God will make it happen for you because if you, if you put His house first, if the kingdom of God is first, it's not even you've sowed seed here. It's your serving here that activates your gift in the world where God will take care of you, take care of His house, He'll take care of your house. You want to travel? God will do that. And it's all come through years, years two things for her. One is the relationship with us. I'm serving in the house. And two is her relationship with her boss. And the, being nice to the people. And being connected to people, not to being nasty. Because relationships are kingdom assets. There's stuff that I don't have. But I got relationships. And they have access to people that we know. And that helps you. And so for some people, when you get involved in them, they, with those relationships, they, they don't respect that. In the book, I speak about the villages. This place called greatness. I'm going to add and I'm done. Warren, I promise you I'm done. Chapter 6 deals with relationships. There are two sets. We speak about greatness in the kingdom of God. There's a village mentality and there are people that are living in greatness. The problem with most of our people is that the only world that they know is the one from the village. They think like it. They act like it. And when you bring them out from the village, they walk in here with dogs and a whole bunch of other things and like, it's not allowed in here. What are we trying to do? Separate you from the village so you can think differently. Because up, up when you're dealing with the protocol of greatness and living up here, those people don't tolerate your nonsense up here. And we're preparing you to connect with great people. Great people. You've got to break from the village mentality. Not everybody knows about Hebra and Gatsby's. Not everybody knows about that. Up there, they're speaking. They sit around the table and there's something called table manners. If I'm telling you, I've watched God. I'm sitting with Dr. Winston and I invited somebody to the table to have dinner because I really respected this person in Africa. I thought, this, your gift is so good. Let's connect you with the people. After a half an hour, we've ordered food and Dr. Winston's been eating and this person's just speaking around the table and speaking about, Af you know, Africa and, and the things that is coming out of her mouth. And Dr. Winston just looked at everybody else, put knife and fork together, Close it. Says, I'll take my jacket now. Gets up and leave. Everybody says, what did we do wrong? Everybody else that knows him knows what she did wrong. He got up and he walked away. Why? There's something called table manners. When you're dealing with greatness. You can't go and speak in a brew in the boardrooms. We're teaching our people how to live in a place of greatness. And how to obey protocols so you can not just enter in, but live up here and travel the globe and come into your highest payday for God. Amen. If anything, and we end off here, um, I remember a friend tweeting um, a few years ago saying there are 365 days in a year. I cannot imagine getting only paid 12 times in 365 days. If you want to change that, go and get yourself a copy of Your Payday, Amen. Rewards for Kingdom Amen. Living. Give it up for Dr. Maxwell Holland, everyone. Thank awesome. you, Dave. Thank awesome. you so much for that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. With everybody standing this morning, chapter 7. Every chapter has been written prophetically. Chapter 1 deals with that God is one and 
You need to frame your world built upon that God's a rewarder. Right believing leads to right living. Chapter 2 speaks about, 2 is the number for procreation. So chapter 2 is wisdom that you can tap into and be connected to God's wisdom for your life. Chapter 3 is Trinity. Is the Trinity. But chapter 3 is also your Trinity. Not just the Holy Spirit, but your life, your purpose, your time, and your season. You only have enough time to fulfill your purpose. Only enough time to fulfill purpose. Chapter 4, the number prophetically is completeness. For north, south, east, and west is the man and his gift. Your gift was not for Ranfontein and El Dorado Park. Your gift was for the world. There's no place on this earth that your gift cannot go and make a difference. Chapter 5 is the grace of God, the anointing that you need, that makes you different to the world. Others will toil. But when the blessing is on you, it maketh rich and brings you into your highest payday. Chapter 6 is the number for man. It's the number of how to connect with people, how to break from the village and its mentality and come into your highest payday by being connected to the right people in the kingdom of God. Chapter 7 is the prophetic hour. It's the urgency of the hour. It's to understand that you need to get busy with the Father's business. It's time to come in on what God has called you to be. You need to know that you're an 11th hour laborer. Christ is coming back. I said, Jesus is coming back. I said, Jesus is coming back. And what are you going to present to Him? What are you going to present to Him at the end of your life? When He returns... What are you going to offer the master? He's not receiving your money. He's receiving your life. And you have to ask yourself the question this morning that if he has to come back today, what do you have to give him? Have you used your time? And have you used your gift? Are you fulfilling heaven's purpose for your life? God is calling you. God is calling everyone in this place. That don't make a vow to read the book. Make a vow before God that you're gonna, your life's going to change because of this book. The people were saying to me, I hope the sales are good. I said, I'm not really interested in the sales. I want this book to touch the hearts and minds of the people. We prayed every day. We opened up this book and started to, to write. We would say, God, give us understanding. The spirit of understanding is going to come upon everyone who opens up this book. You're not going to ever die in the cave of Adullam. You're not going to die in your dysfunction. You're not going to die in your mess. You are coming into your highest payday. Not only you, you, you and your spouse, you and your children, everything that God has got for you, it's in this book. God has got, He's put this thing straight for you. If mommy and daddy don't want to go, you come. If you're the only one in your family, you go and reach your highest payday for God. But the world's waiting for your gift, man. The world's waiting for you. I'm so thankful. The journey has been so tough. But I discovered why God had to take us through different things and experiences so that we can have something to give to you. We've condensed all of that in a way as a code to help you come into your higher space. So that they, from today, no excuse for you not coming into fulfilling your purpose 
coming in and fulfilling what God has got for your life. With every head bowed and eye closed.